Hi, my name is Shelby, and this is Merrily Morbid, the channel where we talk about all sorts of topics as long as they are, well, a little bit morbid. For many of us, we describe the beach as our happy place, but for a few, the beach becomes a place of nightmares. Usually, when we think of how the beach can be dangerous, we think of sharks. But I assure you, there are scarier things to be found on your local beach. So let's get into it. How many of you have had beach-themed bathrooms, complete with a glass jar or basket filled with seashells? How many of you had puka shell necklaces in the 90s or early 2000s when they were oh so popular? And yes, that is a picture of Sam Winchester wearing a puka shell necklace. But did you know that real puka shells come from the shells of cone snails? And did you know that of all 700 species of cone snails, every one is venomous? I didn't. And I certainly didn't know that the two species of cone snails, the textile cone snail and the geography cone snail, are actually venomous enough to kill people. Cone snails are members of the mollusk family, which include other animals like clams, oysters, and mussels. They're usually found in tropical waters around the world. Seashells are a favorite souvenir around the world and are created by mollusks by an organ that they have called a mantle. The mantle excretes calcium carbonate, which crystallizes and hardens, so the shells grow as the snail grows inside. Snails have beautiful shells with all sorts of patterns depending on the species, and it's the beauty of them that lures people in. Humans are most often stung by cone snails when they go to pick up a shell, not realizing that it's still occupied. So it makes sense that most stings are on the palms and the fingers. Their stinging proboscis is long enough to reach any part of their shell, so there is no way to safely pick up a cone snail with your hand, not to mention that the stingers are sharp enough to go through wetsuits, so diving gloves will not protect you. Once a sting happens, it's important to get medical attention fast. What's fascinating is that cone snails have two different types of venom. One that they use on their prey, and an even stronger venom that they use against predators. Unfortunately, sometimes that includes humans. Since cone snails only hunt at night when they are least likely to be encountered by people, the only times people are stung is when they disturb the snails. Depending on the prey of a certain type of cone snail determines how potent its venom is. If the cone snail hunts primarily marine worms, the venom doesn't need to be very potent. If the snail hunts other snails like the textile snail does, then their venom is more potent. Then, for snails that primarily feed on fish, like the geography snail, they have extremely potent venom, which is capable of killing people. The stings from the more potent species can include the following. Sharp pain at the envenomation site, unbearable pain, local numbness, initial weakness, sweating, visual changes, muscle paralysis, respiratory failure, cardiac failure, or coma. Treatment can include submersion in hot water for pain relief, applying pressure to slow and limit the damage from the venom, and in severe cases, the use of a ventilator and other supportive equipment. Because cone snails have extremely complex venom, which contains over 100,000 different compounds, no one has been able to develop an anti-venom for cone snail stings. So even with treatment, some people still die. The fatality rate ranges from 15 to 75 percent. But the good thing is that deaths from cone snails are actually extremely rare. Less than 40 proven cases have happened over the last 300 years. In June 1935, a 27-year-old man named Charles Hugh Garbutt was stung by a geography cone snail while at Hayman Island on the Great Barrier Reef. He had been with a group of friends cruising between the various Whitsunday Islands. When they reached Hayman Island, they all got off the boat and they decided to walk the shallows looking for shells that they could bring back home as souvenirs. They all returned to the boat for lunch. 
Charles, or Charlie to his friends, had decided to look over the shells that he had collected earlier. As he was examining one shell that was about three inches long, he flipped it over and immediately felt a sharp pain on his left palm. Around five minutes later, a friend James found him up on deck, and Charlie immediately told James what had happened. Almost immediately, he told James that he couldn't feel his lips or mouth. He also told him that he couldn't see the hut that was on the island. Immediately, he was brought down into the cabin of the boat where he was given a shot of brandy. At that point, his vision was getting much worse. He was offered another shot of brandy, but was only able to shake his head and mumble something, which included the word choke. They rushed him to the closest phone about 20 miles from where he was stung. They immediately called the doctor and an ambulance was sent out. They decided that they couldn't wait and headed towards where the ambulance would be coming from to cut down on time. They met the ambulance halfway, and by the time he arrived at the hospital, it was already too late. He had already died. It was less than one hour after being stung by a geography cone snail. The next thing I want to talk about is a story that has stuck with me for over a decade. It was just so bizarre that I've never forgotten it, and it's the story that inspired this video. A woman had spent the day at the San Onofre Beach, just over an hour north of San Diego, California. Her children had collected rocks on the beach and decided to keep them. After getting home from the beach, she found that her kids had left the rocks on the floor, so she picked them up and put them in her pocket. Somehow, soon after, her cargo shorts caught fire. When the fire department arrived at the home, the woman's husband was spraying her down with the garden hose. The woman sustained second and third degree burns. Her husband sustained second degree burns trying to get the rocks out of her pocket. The rocks were quickly taken to a local university to be examined. A geologist there saw that the two rocks, one green and one gray, had both some kind of orange substance on them. Tests indicated that it was phosphorus, which is highly flammable. It's believed that the woman walked around with the rocks in her pocket and that a spark from them clinging together must have ignited the phosphorus. But how did that happen? Usually the phosphorus in rocks is oxidized and poses no threat. So most likely it was the result of some human-made version of phosphorus. It was noted that nearby the beach is a marine base, a live firing range, and also a nuclear power plant that had been running at the time. But the most popular theory is that the rocks had been exposed to a military flare that had washed up on shore. And that leads me into my next topic. It's absolutely crazy to me that it's actually pretty common for military artifacts to wash up on shore. Torpedoes, missiles, naval mines. It's just crazy. Just type in any one of those things into Google followed by the words washed up on a beach and you'll find dozens upon dozens of articles from around the world from India to Germany, the United States to Poland. In October 2020, a woman was walking her dog on a beach on Hatteras Island off the coast of North Carolina when she saw what she initially thought was a log. When she got closer, she realized that it was actually metal and some kind of torpedo. She contacted the National Park Service and she waited until the authorities arrived. She was afraid to leave it unattended, worried that somebody else would come across it. Quickly, an explosive ordnance disposal team from the base in Norfolk, Virginia arrived and confirmed that it was a World War II aerial bomb and that it was a live bomb. They set up a perimeter and detonated the bomb. And that wasn't the first bomb to wash up on shore. Turns out that it has happened several times in that area. Although it wasn't confirmed which country originally owned that bomb. We really only have two guesses. It was either American or German. The area, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, was known as Torpedo Junction back during World War II. Cape Hatteras was a big area for merchant ship sea lanes, so it became a target for Germans. The U.S. was wholly unprepared since the U.S. Navy was concentrated in the Pacific, engaged with the Japanese during the war. 
In the first half of 1942, 397 merchant ships were sunk off the East Coast, and more than 80 just off of North Carolina alone. However, during World War II and World War I, the Outer Banks also served as an area where the U.S. practiced dropping bombs from planes, so it could be American. Regardless, it wasn't the first time something like that had washed up on an American beach, and from what we know, it certainly will not be the last. But it's not just these torpedoes that wash up on shore. Sometimes they are uncovered during digging. Indian River County in Florida was used during World War II as a practice location for the military while they prepared for D-Day and other amphibious landings in Europe. The beaches in Indian River County were also bombarded with bombs for the practice of eliminating obstructions that may prevent amphibious landings. Now, the sand dunes that were once the practice site has become popular areas, and once in a while, these bombs are uncovered by unsuspecting people. Back in 2017, a $3.8 million beachfront house was being built when everything came to a screeching halt. Buried beneath three feet of sand on the property was a fully intact torpedo aerial torpedo containing 150 pounds of gunpowder. The explosive ordnance disposal team from the naval base at Jacksonville, Florida arrived and took over. They towed the torpedo to the water where they attached it to floats. Then it was pulled a mile offshore where it was lowered 40 feet down to the seabed. Divers then were tasked with diving down and attaching explosives. The area was completely cleared of all people. The perimeter even included the sky above. And then it was detonated safely. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about is something that most of us never knew could be dangerous. Digging a hole. Just earlier this week, as I am recording this, a seven-year-old girl passed away on a Florida beach after a hole she was digging collapsed on her and her brother. The hole had been dug down about four or five feet deep when it happened. Her brother was buried up to his chest, but the little girl was completely covered in sand. Immediately, dozens of people began desperately trying to dig the little girl out using whatever they could, hands, buckets, but it was to no avail. The sand kept falling as fast as they were digging it out. And when they finally got to her, she had no pulse, and by the time she got to the hospital, she was gone. I cannot imagine the anguish that those parents must be feeling. They were on vacation visiting from Indiana when they were enjoying the beautiful day. It's supposed to be a fun and relaxing trip when your world just falls apart. A child just innocently playing, having no idea how much danger she was in. Turns out, it's much more common than you'd think. A medical study back in 2007 revealed that between three and five children die each year being buried in sand while digging holes. But it doesn't just happen at the beach. It can happen at a park, at your home, anywhere where there's a lot of sand. But what makes this situation even more tragic is that lifeguards are taught the dangers of digging in the sand. But the beach that this tragedy occurred at, in spite of its popularity, didn't employ lifeguards. But the town council has decided that they will discuss hiring lifeguards at their next town meeting. Now we arrive at our next topic, and it's one of the biggest reasons that we need lifeguards rip currents, not to be confused with rip tides. These terms are often used interchangeably, but they are in fact different. A rip tide is a channel of water passing through an inlet, estuary, harbor, or a lagoon, and is caused by the tide going out. A rip current is a fast moving channel of water that forms on a beach and is caused by waves and water trying to find the path of least resistance as it goes back out. Riptides are predictable, and you know when they're going to occur and where they will occur, but rip currents are unpredictable and can form at any time, anywhere. Rip currents are the reason for 80% of rescue attempts and for over 100 deaths each year. Now, there are some things that you should know about rip currents. 
They are capable of forming in water as shallow as two or three feet deep and can be 20 to 100 feet wide. They are actually strongest in low tide. Although they are common during stormy days, they can also be found on nice days as well. Most importantly, people die when they try to swim against the current. Don't even try it. Even Olympic swimmers are not strong enough to swim against a rip current. You can see rip currents because they look like a section of the beach has no incoming waves, while there are waves all around them, so avoid them if you see them. But if you are caught in one, do not panic. If you are not a strong swimmer or you don't have the energy to swim, then float on your back, allow the current to carry you. Rip currents will not pull you under, so once you reach the end of the current, you can swim out and back to the shore, or you can call out for help. If you are a strong swimmer, then swim sideways and parallel to the shore until you swim out of it and then can swim back to shore safely. Just six months ago, in September of 2023, at one beach in New Jersey, three people were trapped in a rip current. Two of them were able to be rescued, but all efforts failed to save the third, who was identified as Edwin Sanchez, who was a 21-year-old from the Dominican Republic. He was hit by a rough wave and then pulled into the rip current. Fifteen lifeguards tried to make a human chain in an attempt to find him, while five other lifeguards were using paddle boards and a jet ski to try to find him. Local and state authorities arrived, and only then were they able to find him, but it was already too late. Edwin had only arrived in the U.S. recently with hopes of a better future. A GoFundMe was set up to raise funds to bring him back home to the Dominican Republic, where he could be laid at rest. Four other people died in New Jersey that same weekend from being caught in rip currents. Now, The next thing I want to talk to you about is something you may have heard of, even if you don't know what it actually is. Harmful algal blooms, more colloquially known as red tide. But not all algae blooms are red in color. Another well-known color is blue-green. Algae blooms are natural and occur regularly. But what's interesting is that humans can cause algae blooms through runoff from agricultural activities, runoff from chemicals that get into natural water systems, or even the abundance of nutrients from sewage getting into the water systems. Just as algae blooms aren't always red, they aren't always harmful either. Many are beneficial because they create an abundance of food for many animals, and algae make up a sizable part of the food chain in the ocean. The kinds of algae that do produce toxins when they bloom can lead to major ramifications. It can affect fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds in addition to people. And surprisingly, even the air above can be harmful. But even non-toxic algae blooms can cause havoc on the environment. It has been recorded that when some non-toxic blooms die off, the process of the decay afterwards can deplete oxygen in the water, which leads to major fish die-offs. Okay, so when does exposure happen and what happens to a person who's exposed? Exposure to toxic algae can occur while swimming, wading, fishing, or just being in the area sometimes. Exposure can happen through drinking contaminated water or eating fish or shellfish that has been exposed to toxic algae. And exposure to toxic algae can cause diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, skin or eye irritation, throat irritation, and difficulty breathing. It can even cause neurological problems. Paralytic shellfish poisoning is a rare type of food poisoning caused by eating shellfish contaminated by their exposure to harmful algae blooms, which include mussels, oysters, and clams. This illness strikes around 2,000 people per year, with around 13% of cases being fatal. Symptoms set in within 30 minutes of eating contaminated shellfish. Since it's caused by the neurotoxins produced by algae, it can cause symptoms that include tingling of the lips, mouth and tongue, a floating or disassociative feeling, shortness of breath, headache, dizziness, difficulty swallowing, difficulty speaking, the feeling of pins and needles, and numbness of the extremities. 
Death occurs when the muscles that control breathing become paralyzed and the person suffocates. One particularly bad outbreak in Guatemala back in 1987 involved clam soup. 187 people became sick in that outbreak and 26 people died. Now we have arrived at our final topic of this video, and it is something that you don't see coming, but injures hundreds of people each year. I'm talking about jellyfish, and specifically the Australian box jellyfish. It has the honor of being called the most venomous marine animal and has also gone by the name sea wasp. They, of course, are found around Australia, but can also be found in the waters around Southeast Asia and parts of the Pacific. The Australian box jelly is the largest of the box jellies and their bells reach up to a foot in diameter and their tentacles can reach up to 10 feet long. What sets them apart from most jellyfish is that the Australian box jelly can actually swim where other jellyfish have little control over where they go and they usually just float with the current. They prefer the shallow waters of Australia's beaches, but can also be found in inland rivers. Since they have clear bells and their tentacles are a clear blue-gray color, they are incredibly hard to see, and people only realize that one is nearby after they've been stung. They also like to rest on the seafloor and can be easily stepped on. After a sting occurs, a person will experience extreme pain, shortness of breath, and purple welts where the tentacles came into contact with the skin. It is possible for the symptoms to last up to two weeks. The first line of treatment to reduce the damage done by stingers embedded in the skin is to pour vinegar over the affected areas as it deactivates the stingers. In part of attempts to reduce jellyfish stings, some beaches employ nets to prevent these jellyfish from swimming into areas with people. People can also wear wetsuits to avoid stings. Still, hundreds of people are stung every year, and around 100 people have died over the last 100 years. Last year in June in Australia, a five-year-old boy was swimming at a beach in northern Australia. He was strung by a box jelly across the legs and his stomach. He was immediately brought out of the water and vinegar was poured over his legs and abdomen by lifeguards who then called an ambulance. The hospital treated the boy and discharged him and one of the lifeguards stated that the little boy was lucky to be alive. A teenager the year before wasn't so lucky. The boy had only been at the beach for around 10 minutes when he came back out of the water wrapped in several feet of jellyfish tentacles. Emergency services were called and when they arrived, they got the tentacles off of him and poured almost eight gallons of vinegar on him. He was rushed to the hospital in critical condition, but unfortunately died from the stings just a couple hours later. What's even more tragic was that he and his family had only just moved to Australia two months prior from the Philippines. The boy, whose name was Mark Ligmeo, was only 14 years old. Anyway, that's it for today. If you like today's topic and want to see even more morbid topics, subscribe and like this video. I have tons of ideas for videos, but if there's anything you want to see in particular, leave a comment below. Videos drop every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and don't forget to see the community page to vote on next week's topic. Be merry, but stay morbid.